it was night till I Memorial Day is the day that the nation has set aside to remember those who have died while serving our country. So for those of you who are here today, who mourn the loss of a loved one, who has died in military service, those who gave the ultimate sacrifice for our country, we just want to pause a moment this morning and say thank you. And we really hope that this weekend is meaningful for you. 
And thanks again for choosing to spend part of it with us here at Perry Creek. We're going to have a great worship service today, and we're going to have a wonderful time worshiping the Lord. In our sermon time today, we are continuing our study of the Apostle Paul's second missionary journey in the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is amazing because it is the history of the beginning of the church. Acts is a history book. And this sermon uh, that we're in today is where we are looking at how the church expanded throughout the whole world. So as we are going to take a look at what happened a long, long time ago, we need to be asking ourselves, what does that have to do with us today? Because, you know, the Bible wasn't just written to tell us what happened in ancient history. It was actually written to change our lives. And, you know, learning about the difficulties and the struggles and the victories of the early church can be really really encouraging to us, especially when we realize that the Holy Spirit that was active in the church back then, the Holy Spirit that did all those amazing miracles and kind of unbelievable things is the same Holy Spirit that we have today working in our church and working in our lives. So I hope you're excited to learn more about that, and I really do think that today's passage is going to be an encouragement for you. Today, I want to talk to you about the topic of how to be an upper-class Christian. How to be an upper-class Christian. Now, I admit that's a little bit of an unusual topic for a sermon. Uh, you probably never heard a sermon on how to be an upper-class Christian, especially like by somebody like me. But, uh, it, 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 you know, in fact, you may wonder what I mean by that. It's a curious topic. Uh, because in an earthly, normal life sort of way, uh, if we're honest, most of us wonder what it would be like to be upper class. Uh, we want to know how the other half lives, right? We're, we're, we're incredibly curious about what's behind that curtain at the front of the airplane. Uh, you know, we want to experience upper class life. And you know, over the years, Kelly and I have tried little tastes of that. From time to time. I remember one time Kelly paid so that Calvin and I could drive a Ferrari around a racetrack. Now, chances are I'll probably never own a Ferrari, but it was fun to experience that. Uh, one time when Kelly and I lived in Zimbabwe, Kelly got a special deal to stay at a very swanky, very exclusive safari lodge called Pamushana. So this was during the height of the political unrest in the country, and no one was coming into Zimbabwe for tourism. So if you were a local, you could get these incredible deals. So Kelly and I stayed in the same room that Michael Douglas and Catherine Zeta-Jones had stayed in the month before. Uh, and it was definitely upper class, okay? It's just a little different from most of the hotel rooms I stay in. Uh, our, our room came with its own private pool. Uh, we had a helipad. <laughs> okay, and granted, we didn't have the helicopter to go with it, but still, we had a helipad, okay? Um, and uh, we, we had our own indoor, outdoor bathroom and shower that was bigger than our family's entire house. And we had all our meals, all our game drives, all our drinks included for the price we paid, which was 27 US dollars a night. We stayed there for six months. No, <laughs> Joe thought we were suffering, didn't you? So it was nice. Of course, the game drive was just about the worst game drive I've ever experienced because we were stuck in a Land Rover for hours with a British business owner who could not stop talking about his business and his grandkids who couldn't care less about the animals. Anyway, um, so it was, a, it, you know, the, the game drive was less than ideal, but hey, we had a helipad. We were upper class, right? So we all want to know what it's like to be upper class. So what do I mean by upper class Christian? Well, today, believe it or not, we're going to look at a passage that's about that. A passage about how to be an upper class Christian. It's a passage about how to get a Ferrari. <laughs> Just kidding. But it's a passage about some Christians that Luke, the writer of Acts, says are truly upper class. So today we're going to learn 
how to be an upper class Christian. Let me invite you, if you have your Bibles, to turn to Acts chapter 17, verses 10 to 15. <clears throat> Acts 17, verses 10 to 15. And today, as we look at this passage, we're just going to do a couple things. First, we're going to just look at the title that Luke gives to these Christians to make sure we understand what he's actually saying. And then secondly, we're going to see four reasons that Luke gives them that title. And guys, all joking aside, here's what we're going to see in this passage. We're going to see four qualities that you can have as a Christian. These qualities don't actually relate to your income or your social status. They're not actually deep mysteries. You don't have to be a highly experienced Christian to have these things. In fact, they're not even surprising. But they are four very important reminders of what makes someone a better class of Christian. And it's my prayer today that we'll just kind of take inventory, that we'll be encouraged. This will be a little bit of a lighter sermon, but just that we'll be encouraged by this story and, and that we'll look at our lives and see if these qualities are there. All right? Now, as we get ready to read our passage today, let me just remind you of where we're at in the story of Acts. So, last week, Paul and his companions... Silas, Timothy, and Luke, the guy that wrote Acts. Um, they were in northern Greece, in Macedonia. They were in the capital city of Thessalonica, where Paul preached the gospel in the synagogue and where they suffered for the gospel as unbelieving Jews stirred up a mob and demanded that Paul and his companions leave the city. And that's where we are when Luke begins our story in Acts 17, verse 10. Luke says this, The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, and not a few of Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul in Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea or to the coast, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I, I just pray that you would open our hearts as we look at this passage. Uh, Father, I pray that you would direct me as I preach, that you would just open my mouth, and Holy Spirit, that you would guide the things that are said. This is a lighter passage, a more fun passage, but Father, what we're talking about is serious business. These things that help us grow as Christians. And so, Lord, please do convict. Please do help us to see where we can follow you, uh, you know, more precisely, Lord, how we can grow in our faith and, and kind of step into that next level that Luke is describing here. So, Father, please open our hearts, open my mouth, and, and fill us with your spirit as your word is proclaimed. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so our story begins with Luke, uh, Luke giving a title to these Christians in Berea. He give, in Berea, he gives them a name, a designation. Luke declares the Christians in Berea to be upper class, okay? He declares them to be upper class. Let's walk through the first few verses of our story, and I'll show you what I mean. So the story starts in verse 10 where Luke tells us the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Um, so you, when Luke says the brothers there, he is referring to the Christians in Thessalonica. You may remember from last week that the Thessalonian Jews who had rejected the gospel stirred up a violent mob against Paul and his companions, and they charged him with sedition against Caesar. Now, the authorities did not prosecute Paul for sedition, but they did require bond. They required money as a pledge that Paul and his companions wouldn't stir up any more riots. So the Thessalonian Christians kept Paul hidden until nightfall, 
And then under cover of darkness, they sent him and his companions away. So this was both to avoid a riot, and it was also so that the Jews who hated Paul would not know which direction he went, so they couldn't follow him and stir up trouble in the next town. And Paul decides the next town will not be another big regional capital like Thessalonica. Rather, the next town will be Berea, a smaller, more out-of-the-way town that's about 50 miles away by foot. So Paul and his companions go to Berea, and spoiler alert, when they arrive there in Berea, Paul does the same thing he does in every town, right? I mean, if I were there, if, if it were me, I might lay low for a little while, okay? I think I would figure since I had been beaten and imprisoned in one town and had a peasant mob with pitchforks come after me in the next that I could take a Sabbath off, right? But not Paul, okay? He does what he always does. He goes to the synagogue, the Jewish house of worship, and he immediately commences to preach the gospel. And as Paul preaches the gospel, he discovers something completely unexpected. A different class of Jew. So look at what Luke tells us in verse, in beginning of verse 11. He says, now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Now look at that. Luke uses an interesting word to describe these Jews. The NIV and the ESV translate it more noble. And that's really what it means. The actual word that Luke uses there is eugenes. It's a combination of two words. The word you in Greek, which means good or well, like a eulogy where you speak well of somebody. And the word genes, which means birth or origin, like genesis. And when you put these two words together, it means well-born. It refers to someone who was born into the noble or upper class. So Paul uses this word when he's talking to the Corinthians and he says, not many of you were of noble birth. Same word. It also shows up in one of Jesus' parables where he talks about a nobleman who became a king. So this word literally means to be noble, to be upper class. So this word refers to people who stick their pinky out when they drink tea. Right? Uh, they, they wear turtlenecks and smoking jacket. They, they carry snifters of brandy. I don't know what a snifter is, but they do, and they carry it with them, right? Okay, so if you've ever watched Gilligan's Island, uh, think Thurston Howell III, okay? Just out of curiosity, how many of you know what Gilligan's Island is? Okay, good, so we're not losing that cultural treasure. Anyway, um, they are a noble class. So that's the word that Paul uses to describe these Jews. They were noble Jews. So what exactly is Luke saying here? Is he actually saying that the Bereans were richer or that they came from better bloodlines than the Thessalonians? No, that's not what he's saying. You know, later on, Paul refers to all the Macedonian churches as being poor. So Luke is not saying that they were richer. Nor, when he calls them upper class, is Luke saying that some Christians should look down on other Christians. Okay, that's not the point. We're having a little bit of fun today by talking about that term upper class. But the point is not that we should divide everybody into upper class and lower class Christians. That's kind of a blatant violation of the gospel. Okay, so we're not, you know, so that's not what Luke is saying. But what he is saying is that there was something special about these Jews at Berea. You know, and he uses this word to say that this was a different class of Jew than what he had encountered, who became a different class of Christians. Their faith was what we might call next level. You know, and he mentions the Thessalonians here because he wants us to compare the two. He wants us to compare the Bereans to the Thessalonians, so that we can see what put these Bereans in a different class spiritually, so that we can imitate them and become more noble in our faith. Okay, so Luke describe or declares the Christians in Berea to be upper class. All right. Now, what was it that made these guys more noble? What was it that made them upper class Christians? What's the difference 
that Luke wants us to look for. Well, if we compare what Luke says about the Thessalonians with what he says about the Bereans, we can see that there are four differences, four qualities that made them upper class Christians, four qualities that we should all strive to possess, okay? So the first quality that Luke points out is this, they receive the word with eagerness. They receive the word with eagerness. Okay, so upper class Christians receive the word with excitement. Look at what Luke tells us in verse 11. He says, now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness. So these guys were excited to hear the teaching of the word of God. Now, once again, Luke uses an interesting word to describe their eagerness. It's a word that's actually related to the word for anger or rage. You know, it normally relates to getting really worked up about something. The way Luke uses it, it has positive connotations. So the main idea that this word conveys is that these guys were fired up, right? They were excited to hear the gospel. So they were anxious to hear what Paul has to say. And Luke says this puts them in a different class because it's very different to what Paul experienced at Thessalonica. In fact, look at how Luke describes Paul's ministry in Thessalonica. This is from earlier in the chapter. He says that Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. So notice what Luke says there. Paul reasoned from scripture. Paul explained to them. Paul proved to them. And Luke goes on to say that Paul got a lukewarm response. No pun intended, okay? But he says, seriously, you know, they, they kind of were like, eh, I don't know. It's like they were holding up scorecards while Paul was preaching. And when you read this, you very much get the impression that Paul was doing all the work, right? So he's explaining, he's reasoning, he's proving. It's like he's trying to feed a finicky toddler, right? Here comes the choo-choo. Open up. This is good for you. Really it is, okay? But these guys in Berea are hungry for the word. You know, they can't wait to hear more. And, and let me tell you something, guys. That is a different class of Christian. There is no comparison between Christians who hear the word and Christians who are eager to hear the word. The difference is night and day. And when I say that, I mean it quite literally, because when I was teaching at the theological college in Zimbabwe, I had a night class and I had a day class, and they were very, very different from each other, and the difference was that one class was eager to hear the word. So, you know, we had this day class that was like a regular de degree program where students lived on campus and earned their degree. And most of the students there were thinking about, you know, maybe going into ministry, but they were mostly there for one reason, to get credentials, right? They wanted their degree. And, and, and our college was probably the cheapest degree probably in the, in, in the world at the time. It was like 10 bucks a term or something, okay? So these guys were there for credentials. And let me just say, getting those day students to learn was like pulling teeth. It was 100% obligation. Meanwhile, I had this night class. And these were people who were already in ministry. And they were trying to learn new skills, and they were eager for the word. You know, I'll never forget the first day of class when I taught Greek too. So, you know, I came to the day class, the day students came in, they were late, they whined about the work, and then they went on to their next class. When I arrived 15 minutes early to set up for the night class, the whole class was in place. They were all sitting there ready to go. They had gotten together over the break. And every student in that class had memorized the first two lessons of the textbook so that we could get on with it and make the most of our time together. Now, let me ask you a question. Which class do you think I prefer to teach? <laughs> you know, the night class, I love that class, right? The difference between teaching the day class and teaching the night class was like the difference between pushing a car and trying to steer it 
and steering a car that's already rolling down the road. There's no comparison. You know, those nine students, they weren't there for credentials. They were there because they were eager to hear the word. And it made them a different class of Christian. You know, guys, there are some Christians who come to church for credentials. You know, they come to church to check the box. To say, yes, I, I, I did what I was supposed to do. I came to church. But if you want to be a different class of Christian, be eager for the word. You know, let this thing change your life. Let this thing transform your thinking. You will never be the same again. And there's nothing that compares to the word of God. So be eager for the word. So you know, every uh, Saturday night at about 7 o'clock, Something happens at my house. The phone rings, and I pick it up, and I hear this voice on the other side of the phone. It says, John, this is Avi Clements. What you preaching on tomorrow? <laughs> Every Saturday night, Avi wants to know so she can read the chapter on Saturday night and get her heart ready to receive the word. She's eager. And wow, do you know what that does to me as a preacher? I mean, that, that makes me so happy. It reminds me that, listen, bud, your sermon matters. There's somebody who's paying attention to you, somebody who's, who's looking for God to speak to them. She, you know, it makes a difference. She's eager for the word, okay? So from now on, I want each and every one of you to call me every Saturday night and ask me. No, but listen, it, she's eager for the word and it makes a huge difference. Okay, so the first quality of an upper class Christian is that, they're, that, that they receive the word with eagerness. Okay, now the second quality is this. They examine the scriptures. They examine the scriptures. And this is what many people think of when they think of this Berean church. So the Bereans really search their Bibles. In fact, in many circles, Christians who sort of know their Bibles really well are, are called Bereans. Uh, my sisters went to a school uh, when I was growing up called Berean Academy um, because they wanted the kids to know their Bibles, all right? So look at this, the last part of verse 11. Paul says, or Luke says, now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So not only did the Bereans receive Paul's teaching with eagerness, but they also examined their Bibles to see if what he said was true. And once again, I promise this is the last Greek word I'm going to talk about today, okay? We all know that I know Greek. We're all impressed, right? I'm just kidding. Okay, but, but seriously, the, the word that is used here it is an important word. It's an intense word. Word. It doesn't just mean that they sort of glanced at their Bibles to make sure Paul was quoting real Bible verses. They, they really dug in. So the word that Luke uses here is a courtroom word. It, it's a word that um, it does that, you know, that, that means to judge hard. It's sometimes translated cross-examine. This is the word for the trial that Jesus had before the authorities. So the Bereans, they were really examining, they were scrutinizing the things that were taught. They weren't letting Paul go do their thinking for them. Right? They're examining the word to see if these things are really true. And when I think about that, you know, the first thing that I see there is just that the gospel can withstand scrutiny. You know what I mean? I mean, have you got questions about the gospel? So, so I know some of the people that are attached to our church, some that are attending, they're going, I'm not convinced as a Christian yet. I have questions. You got questions? Good. Okay, Luke applauds the Bereans for questioning uh, these things, whether these things are true. He wants them to ask questions. And you know, if the gospel's true, it should hold up to our examination. Right? I mean, we can't see God, and we can't know for sure what the afterlife is exactly like, so there is faith required, but we can look at the scriptures, we can see if it all fits together, right? We can see if what Jesus taught and what we teach really lines up with the Old Testament and with the whole Bible, because it should all fit together, right? One of the things we say here at Perry Creek, what do we believe about scripture? We believe scripture is true, 
that it fits together and that it's good for us. It can withstand our questions. So I see that. Then the other thing that I think about when I think about these guys examining Scripture is how important that is for producing leaders and workers in the church. So, you know, Paul needed leaders as he moved from city to city planting these churches. He had to have workers and leaders that knew the word. And that's one of the reasons that whenever Paul came to a town, he always started his mission in the synagogue. Right? He always went to the Jews first. And there's a theological reason for that. The Jews carried the torch of God's program on earth for 1,400 years. So they sort of get first swing at the gospel. But secondly, Paul needs to produce leaders. Right? He, he started in the synagogue because he needs leaders. And the synagogue is where Paul could find leaders who knew their Bible. You know, the synagogue was where Jews and Gentile converts to Judaism had heard the Old Testament taught every week. And just think about it. Paul never knew when he went into a town how long he was going to be able to stay there. Right? So, so the quickest place for him to find men and women who knew their Bibles and could lead and work in the church was the synagogue. So Paul wants to go to the synagogue first, and when he goes there, what he wants to find is exactly what he found in Berea. People who are examining the word. People who think biblically for themselves. And you know, guys, that's so important. You know, I've said it before, but I've seen churches and I've even been in churches where there's really only one leader. You know, it's like the, the pastor pretty much is the only guy that makes decisions. When I was growing up, we thought of the pastor as like the antenna that received the instructions from God. And our job as church members was not to be growing disciples who thought for ourselves. Our job was really just sort of to obey the pastor's vision. We needed to be loyal to the pastor. But you know, that's not the way the New Testament portrays the church. Right? We're to be a body of disciples who have a personal relationship with Christ. And each one of us should be engaged with Scripture. The New Testament calls each one of us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds as we learn to think according to Scripture. The New Testament calls each one of us to, to test all things that we hear in teaching and to hold on to that which is good. It calls us to think for ourselves. And that doesn't mean that you have to be a Bible expert, okay? But we should all be in the Word and learning to think more biblically. You know, right now, our elders and myself and some others, we're doing a, a, a seminary-level course together on how to study your Bible. Um, so the, the, those guys are going to be worked hard. We're going to go over some challenging stuff. We're looking at grammar and you know how to do a word study and historical cultural research. I'm going to work them really hard, but they're eager to do it because they want to learn more about the word. They want to be better workers, better leaders, and leaders and workers, you know, like the Bereans. We want to be people who examine the word. Okay, so upper class Christians. Hear the word. Secondly, they examine the scriptures. Now, the third quality of upper class Christians, the third thing that sets them apart is this they gather frequently. They gather frequently. In other words, they get together, whether it's the large gathering on Sundays or whether it's small groups in the middle of the week or whatever it is, they love getting together. They gather frequently. And Luke shows us this in our passage. So I don't know if you remember what Luke said about the Jews in Thessalonica that I read just a few minutes ago. But he said that Paul preached to them on three consecutive Sabbaths. So in other words, he was with them for three Saturdays in a row. Now that's good. That means they were faithful to attend their weekly service at the synagogue. But notice what Luke says about the Bereans in verse 11 again. Luke says this, They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. In other words, these guys got together and peppered Paul with questions, not weekly, but daily. 
every day. And what Luke is saying is that one way that you can see their eagerness for the word, one way that you can see their devotion is that these guys gathered daily. They gathered frequently. And I would say that's the mark of a, of a sort of next level faith, an, uh, a, an upper class Christian. So Christians whose faith has gone to the next level know that worship, you know, gathering and worshiping and learning and doing community together is important. Now, am I saying that we should have church every day? Because that's what the Bereans said. Uh, no, the, the situation at Berea had sort of special circumstances. Paul didn't know how long he was going to be there, and this was all new to them. They're trying to figure it out, and they're trying to figure it out in a hurry. So I'm not saying that we need to have church every day, but I am saying that, that gathering together to learn from God's Word and to worship Him, whether it's on Sunday or with your small group, it's important. And upper-class Christians love to do that. You know, last Sunday night, I gathered with Hope and Ricky Therrington's small group. And I have to say, it's evident that these guys do not like each other. No, <laughs> I'm just, they love to get together. Right? You just feel the energy in the room. They love to do life together, to support each other, to learn together, to pray for each other, to carry each other's burdens, to do all those things that Scripture tells us to do. And as they gathered last Sunday night, they were peppering me with questions about my sermon. Um, and, and you could tell how important that gathering is for real spiritual growth. You know, it's so important that we gather. You know, guys, I have to tell you that I have concern at times for the future of the church in America. You know, I wonder at times, is it going to be healthy 50 years from now? And do you know what my single greatest concern is? It's not doctrinal purity. We have lots of good teaching and resources. I'm not worried about that. My greatest concern is not that the church might face persecution. We probably will face church persecution. That is the natural state of the church. My, my greatest concern is not that the American church doesn't do enough outreach. My greatest single concern is church attendance. Just good old-fashioned, come to church on Sunday and small group in the week, church attendance. And I, I know I don't need to be telling you that. You're here on Memorial Day weekend, right? So you all should get a sticker or some kind of little trophy or something, right? But I am concerned that we not lose the discipline of gathering week in and week out. Gathering is important to the health of the church. The church cannot be what God made it to be unless it gathers regularly. In fact, that's what the church the word church means. Did you know that? You know, the word church in the Greek, ecclesia, it doesn't mean disciples, it doesn't mean a building, it, it doesn't mean believers, it literally means the gathering. It means the assembled ones. And that tells us something about the nature of the church. It was meant to gather, and upper, Christian, uh, upper class Christians know that. They love to get together, okay? And they gather regularly, all right? So, so upper class, or more noble Christians, first of all, they are Christians um, who are eager to hear the word. Secondly, they examine scriptures. Thirdly, they gather frequently. Now, lastly, they have an active faith. They have an active faith. You know, as a result of the other qualities that made them noble, their eagerness, their examining, their gathering, these Jews in Berea developed an active faith, a faith that was obedient, a faith that was accompanied by deeds, that they developed an active faith. So let me show you what I mean. Um, first of all, these Bereans developed faith. So look at what Luke says in verse 12. He says, many of them, meaning many of the Jews, Therefore believed, and not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. So Luke is saying that many of these Bereans believed. And this is in contrast to Thessalonica, where Luke tells us just a few believed. So these guys hunger for the truth caused them to believe the gospel. But they didn't just stop at believing, they put their faith into action. 
And this is the last sort of contrast between Berea and Thessalonica. You may have noticed at the beginning of our passage when I read the sort of uh, uh, Thessalonians are at the beginning of our passage that we preach today that when persecution broke out in Thessalonica and it was time for Paul to go, the Thessalonians came out with Paul by night and they sent him on his way. Right? I'm sure they gave him good advice about where to go and how to get there, but Luke doesn't record that any Thessalonians were going with Paul. But when things fall apart in Berea, there's a more active response. Look at what Luke says in verses 13 to 15. He says, but when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there to agitating and stirring up the crowd. Okay, so wow. These unbelieving Jews from Thessalonica hate Paul so much that when they figure out he's in Berea, they take the 50-mile walk to go persecute him there. They stir up a mob, just like they did in Thessalonica. Verse 14, Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. So in contrast to the Thessalonians, the Bereans went with Paul. And here's the thing, they went a long ways. Okay, so when we first read verse 14, it sounds kind of like the Bereans just sort of sent Paul off and put him on a boat, right? But as we read the end of the story, we see that that's not what happened. For one thing, Paul probably didn't go by boat. When we look at the way that Luke describes things, it seems that they took him not to the sea to get into a boat, they took him to the coast. And, 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 and then they walked 350 miles to Athens with Paul before Paul sent them back to get Silas and Timothy. So these guys walked 700 miles round trip to make sure that Paul was safe. They didn't just send Paul. They went with him. Well, let me tell you something. That's active faith. <laughs> okay? They, they believed the gospel. They believed it enough to protect Paul. And they wanted to help him as he proclaimed the gospel in other cities. So they believed it enough to be inconvenienced by it. Enough to take action. And guys, that's the kind of faith that God calls us to have. The kind of faith that leads us to action. The kind of faith that calls us, you know, causes us to do something about what we've learned. If you want to make me feel uh, good uh, about myself, like when I'm out there shaking hands and people are leaving, you can tell me that was a good sermon or that was interesting or you really convicted the guy sitting next to me or something like that, right? But if you really want to make me joyful, if you really want to encourage me, tell me what you did about last week's sermon. Mm -hmm. Say, so you said such and such, and I went out and I tried it. And here's how it went. And that is what makes a big, that is a different class of Christian. You know, the, the book of James says, don't be hearers of the word only. Be doers. Put the word into practice. Okay, so how do we put this passage into practice? You know, what is Luke inviting us to do by telling us this story of the Berean Christians? Like Kelly said, these are stories, but they're not just stories. They're not just in the Bible because they happen. This thing is alive and it has the capacity to change our lives, okay? So what does Luke want us to do? Well, I think it's simple. He's inviting us to take inventory. Right? Just as Luke laid these two cities side by side and invited us to compare the Thessalonians to the Bereans, he's inviting us to compare ourselves to the Bereans. He's inviting us to look at our lives and see if we have these things that made the Bereans more noble. Are we eager to hear? Are we excited about what we're going to learn from the Word? You know, are we in the Word? 
Are we examining the scriptures? Are we going, to, is this really the case? How should my thinking or my lifestyle change as a result of that? Are we gathering frequently? You know, it, it's hard to do life out there on your own. Are you gathering with other believers frequently? Are we putting our faith into action? So Luke invites us to look for these things in our life. In fact, I would just encourage you to take some time this Memorial Day weekend, just find a quiet place for a few minutes and take inventory. Right? Just ask yourself, which of these four qualities is kind of my strongest? Which of these is more of a struggle for me? Think about it. Take inventory and ask God to show you what he would have you to do by his strength. This isn't about you trying harder or going, oh, I checked off. This is not about credentials. This is about you responding to God's spirit, looking at these things and seeing what he's calling you to do. Is there anything he's calling you to do to take your faith to the next level, to become a more noble Pray about it to see. And then next Sunday we'll all wear our turtlenecks and our smoking jackets <laughs> to church, okay? But no brandy. No brandy. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this kind of lighter, encouraging passage. We thank you for the example of the Bereans. And Lord, I thank you for Christians who have these characteristics and just the incredible encouragement they are um, to one another and, and to me as a pastor. Lord, we thank you for that. And we pray that we would exhibit these qualities more and more, that we would, you know, uh, really be eager to hear the word, that we would really, you know, dig into our Bibles, that it would transform us that we would gather faithfully and frequently. And Lord, that we would put our faith into practice. Father, all these things are only done through the help of your Spirit. They're not meant to be done through our own strength. But we pray that you would transform us as we follow you. We ask it in Jesus' name.
Justice has